Hello, everyone. My name is Adlan Fela, Chief Analyst at Maravidis. Today is my great pleasure to welcome Craig Thomas for this new episode of the Industry Shakers. Craig Thomas is the CEO of the Broadband Forum. Hello, Craig. How are you today? Really good, Elaine. Thank you very much for the invitation. Great to talk to you. Absolutely. My pleasure. So let's start with you telling us or giving us an overview of your latest programs and initiatives. Yeah, sure. So from a broadband forum perspective, it's a really interesting time for broadband. So we have, we just last year, we were celebrating 30 years of focusing on broadband from ADSL all the way up to, you know, the latest fiber access technologies. But we're really at a tipping point where our focus has traditionally been about connectivity. How do I make the right connection on a broadband network? And the new focus over the last couple of years to recognize that the connection alone isn't enough. Just showing increased speeds over speeds over speeds from, you know, the megabit to a gigabit to multi-gigabit is a necessity. But what the users are doing with that and therefore more intelligent broadband is really important to us. So we've had this focus on from connectivity driven to services led broadband, where the initiative now is to con continue with how to build the best broadband networks but also to recognize the user requirements and the network requirements for that broadband to make it more intelligent, more agile. So I can look at things like QOE, I can look at AI and ML and what that means to the user. I can look at the security requirements, the sustainability requirements above and beyond just delivering a connection. And that's critical to us. So there's a lot of new work that's going on with that. And QOE around sustainability, around AI and ML. And also now we're just starting and looking at broadband has been traditionally a residential service, but when we're building networks that are going to 25 gig, 50 gig, even 100 gig pond in the not so far future, service providers are telling us that they want it to be business related broadband as well. So looking at the business requirements, so SD-WAN, home working, interconnection, IoT, industrial IoT, some new areas of us to look at. But from a traditional perspective, things like USP, our user platform or TR369, how do I manage the whole user experience within the home and to the home and the services? That's an evolution from TR69 now to managing all the devices or as many devices behind the broadband fee as possible is critical. Our work in the access group around the access technology is critical as well. So how do I ensure that the interoperability of my fiber connection can be over across multiple different vendors. So we're doing a lot of work on XGSPON, and now we've just launched standards on 25 gig PON and 50 gig PON there. Uh, so I'm sharing the this image that we created a few years back, 2019. Is, is this, I mean, this is this still up to date or? I would, I, would, I would update it, but the most, the key points are still accurate, yes. But there's okay. a few up. Okay, well, we'll we'll do that after after the show for sure. Yeah. So, okay, so you you did mention USP and, and other technical reports. So, perhaps it may be easier for the audience if we talk about the different programs in terms of access, connected user, okay. and network yeah. architecture. So, why, yeah. do, why don't we start with access then? Okay, let's start again. So, from our traditional base, we have different work areas. Access is the first one that. Basically, how do I connect from the network edge to the user? So that last mile connectivity, whether that's fiber, copper, or increasingly things like access as well. Within the home, there's everything that we do within connected users. So that's you know, very much USP and how we connect services and manage those services to the end user, as well as doing things like Wi-Fi performance measuring as well. Looking further inside the operator's network, we have network architecture that looks at everything from the OLT to the data center. So things like BNGs and distributed BNG, a lot of the virtualization of services and disaggregation of services, which then leads us into a provider cloud group, which is the everything FDN, NFE, and increasingly AI, ML, and eventually autonomous networking. So everything in those sectors as well. So an end-to-end broadband network architecture. Okay, that's that's very useful. Hi there, Magnus Johansson, CEO at Ybus. Thanks again for joining us for another fascinating conversation. For the past ten years, we've quietly powered managed Wi-Fi solutions for ten of America's biggest telcos. 
If you use branded Wi-Fi from AT&T, Frontier, or Optimum, chances are you experienced our tech already. Now we're stepping out from behind the scenes, bringing this proven platform directly to MSPs like you. If vendor lock-in, rigid roadmaps, rising costs, and growing complexity are holding your MSP hostage, you're not alone. 72% of MSP CEOs are right there with you. Here is your way out. YBIP OS, our open source vendor agnostic OS built specifically for MSPs. Think of it as your Android moment, restoring your strategic control and agility. One intuitive dashboard to manage your tech stack, done. Legacy enterprise Wi-Fi running seamlessly alongside next generation open Wi-Fi, absolutely. Reduce your R&D costs by at least 30% immediately. Embedded live SDK engineers for rapid customization. Yes, on demand and ready to go. So are you feeling ready for a transformational freedom? Then visit ybus.com or scan the QR code to book a one-on-one -on -one with me. And in just 15 minutes, let's onboard your MSP for a game-changing BUC. Stop reselling someone else's vision Forge your legacy with Ybus. See you soon. And then you have service requirements and, and young ninjas. Can you tell us about those two things? A new work area that we've brought in is the service requirements group. And this is really interesting work for us because we're trying to drive what the service levels and service requirements that everything inside the broadband network should be adhering to. So what are the user service requirements? And also what is the network requirement, whether it's a wholesale or a retail provider's network requirement. And what we're doing is encouraging people like the CTO office and the service planning office, standards groups, not just those techie network engineers who are brilliant, but we're trying to get that overarching requirement. And then a glue across all the work areas is our common yang ninjas. They are the guys that swoop in and enforce basically a common management across all elements of the network so that it can move into an SDN, NFB, AI-driven autonomous network. Got you. And then maybe a good segue would be, you know, your open source initiatives. There's open broadband and they have different flavors of that. What can you tell us? Yeah, so we are a standards body, but we also have a focus on open source software. And this is where our open broadband or OB projects comes in. We work closely with other open source organizations, but we also have our own open source software groups that you don't even have to be members of. You just have to write a participation agreement to help us write the software and the open source software that drives standards to deployability. So, you know, some major ones of that is OBUSP agents, which gives an agent so that people can play with, model and develop their own USP services into their networks. Other ones include things like UDPST. Now, this is exciting work driven by service providers that is developing the speed test that includes the delay as well as just speed and QOE and latency to speed beyond where traditional speed tests go. So when you're looking at more than 500 megabit services, and that's where those driven by service providers is going. There's seven or eight other OB projects where we work our open source. Software. Okay. You mentioned collaboration with other open source organizations. Can you name them and yeah. describe? So no standard is an island. Um, we work with a lot of other standards bodies, but increasingly we're working with a lot of other open source uh, organizations. So when you look inside the home and the user experience, things like the Purple Foundation, people like RDKB and Open.T, we work closely to make sure the work that we're doing on USP and containerization and data modeling with TR181 fits their models as well. So there's a very close collaboration there. Now, outside of that, we've got a close working relationship with the, the Linux Foundation Broadband Group, or used to be ONF, where we're looking at how is the architecture, the modeling, and the services, the disaggregation and virtualization of the inside the network looking. Two good examples of how we're working on standards and close collaboration with open source software organizations. Yeah, very interesting. Now, let's dive into the work you're doing on the MDU space, a, a market that I quite familiar with. Other organizations like the WBA have now specific groups for MDU. What are you doing there? So we've always had a, a group looking at the MDU space. That's now part of our access group. 
we're looking at really three or four different areas of MDU. And how do you solve that MDU problem where, you know, access to the building isn't necessarily as easy as deploying Fiber 89. So we have on the copper side some projects, Fiber to the Distribution Points, which has been going for quite some time. Uh, we've extended that now to something called Fiber to the Extension Points as well. Now, the major difference there is traditionally you had a fiber network that stopped outside the building and then a copper network that was distributing it. And they were two different management planes, management functions. With fiber to the extension points, what we're doing is collapsing that with common yang interfaces so that you can have one management platform doing both the fiber and the copper inside the building and still deliver multiple gigabits to the apartment or to the MTU business. So that's really exciting. And in a stretch to that, we've also been working with the Home Grid Forum on a collaborative approach to certification so that we have standardization from HGF and performance sets in the BBF that vendors can use to prove not just they interoperate, but they meet a set level of performance, that multi-gigabit load latency requirement. So that's key. Now, the next new exciting thing that we are just doing on Working Text now, working on a publication in, in the not-so-far future, is how do I then take things like fiber FWA, fixed wireless access, and have a single antenna or single modem to the MDU, and then distribute that FWA using the existing copper inside the building so that it isn't just a fiber to the MDU, it can be FWA to the MDU. Okay, so what triggered that? initiative on the MDU space? Is it MSPs or BSPs or is it the vendors that are initiating that or driving this? Yeah, that's a good question. It's always a mixture of the of both. So often our new <clears throat> project NPIPs come from the service provider community saying, I have a problem. I need to know what the best approach, the best architecture or the standards or interoperability is. And then the vendors also get involved to say, okay, let's work on the technical requirements and go through the whole process of contributions to deliver a standard that meets the service provider requirement. Uh, on the FWA side, that actually came out of our work that we do in the wireless wireline convergence side. That this provider said, yeah, that's great, but I need FWA, whether I'm managing it from my 5G core or through my fixed access network. I need to be able to offer FWA to both circumstances. So that's where that works so. Okay. Do, do you guys consider yourselves a standard organization or more of a best practice no, organization? Can I take the cheap answer and say both? Both. Okay. <laughs> we take what I often describe as we take the standards that may come from embedded in chipsets, like from the ITU, for example. And we, t and we use the, the best practices, the architectures and the standard to say, how do I take that chipset standard and make it a deployable standard that I can put services across? Okay. So we do develop marketing reports, architecture design, data modeling, standards, and as well as migration of, uh, opportunities that therefore has both multi-vendor interoperability and common architecture. Yeah, it makes sense. Understood. Can you describe some of the collaborations you have currently with other industry associations and standard bodies? I mean, you mentioned OpenWRE and, and Purple Foundation, but what about other associations? Adeline, I, I mean, that's a really great question that would probably take an hour to go through on <laughs> whatever collaborations we have. I mean, when you look at the traditional standards bodies, everything to do with PON and the ITU, and now Cable Labs with Coherent PON as well. You know, we're doing a lot of that. We work with Etsy and the IEEE and the IETF on, on working and adding to their standards to make it broadband specific. And we liaise regularly with those organizations. Cable Labs, as I said, is a really interesting one because you've got the cable operators that, especially for new territory, are, are looking at fiber more than extending DOCSIS. You know, they have DOCSIS based successfully in their operating network, but for new territories, so there's a lot of collaboration and conversations going on there. The list goes on WBA, Wi Fi Alliance, Home Grid Forum, and MoCo, and FSAN, and TM Forum. We liaise regularly on that work because not one standard is the end to end picture. We're all putting jigsaws together to build that end-to-end -end pitch. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's a very complex and vast endeavor. Maybe to finish off, you know, we spoke a lot about technology, but one thing that as an industry analyst, I also look at is, you know, how profitable and, you know, sustainable the business model is for broadband operators. And, and as you know, you know, they're selling more speeds, more speeds seems like a race to the bottom. How can your technology enable, you know, 
new services and new revenue streams for operators? Yeah, when you look at the traditional model of, you know, you differentiate on price or speed and that race to the bottom. At some stage, the subscriber is waking up and saying, I don't need more speed yet. They will do. So how do I monetize the investment? And this is very much what our service requirements group is all about and as well the work in the connected user. How do I add value on top of that? And it comes in two forms. It's what I call connectivity plus, you know, how do I offer security, home managed Wi-Fi, those type of services that are directly linked to the connection? And then how do I offer value added services on top? Maybe it is home working, gaming, e-health applications. So what we're building with our partnerships in open source as well is a model where you can move to an app store type environment, just like you have on your Apple or your your whatever phone device you have, and look at containerization of services. Right. So I don't have to wait for a firmware upgrade. I can dynamically drop securely into a Docker-like environment new services that are secure and independent to anything else, so they won't hurt any other stuff that you're offering. And doing that dynamically in TR69 and USB is critical to that. And then the work that we're doing on QOE, where ultimately QOE is this big, broad subject, but where it will become quality on demand. When I want to access my VR goggles, I'm going to have the right quality for that on demand when I'm gaming or when I'm video streaming. But it isn't always on, but I dynamically can offer it as an SLA and add value on top, as well as the service itself. Well, it's a lot to unwrap. We probably will need more episodes. So I want to thank you, Craig, for sharing your insights today. It was very, very interesting. Please don't forget to like, subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can also, you know, use the QR code on top of my head here to subscribe to our free weekly newsletter. And until the next episode, thank you very much. Thank you, Adelaide.